Welcome to The Big L, your unofficial source for Libertarian Party news, arcana, and information for the liberty-minded political junkie. Find us at BigLPodcast.com. Here's your host, Libertarian Party insider and the pink flame of liberty, Karen Ann Harlos. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Episode 12 of The Big L Podcast. After I've had a wee bit of an absence... So what the L have I been up to? And as I say that question, my internal hamster nuts up a bit, to be honest, and says to me, are you smoking crack or something? What have we been doing? What haven't we been doing? Well, I pat the little guy on his head and say, well, an episode of the big L for starters. Oh, shit. Okay. Pro tip. Don't make fun of your internal hamster or you spill Diet Mountain Dew. Hold on. All over the place. It's a sticky situation. Yeah, that was that was bad pun. But oh, I'll be dealing with this for a year. But anyway, ADD, ADHD, whatever it may be, back to the topic. So, okay, I... Well, forget it. The hamster just made me spill soda all over the place. So I've changed my mind. No, I'm not going to be nice. So get back on that wheel or no kibble for you. Nothing for you. You see, I have both a gift and a curse. And that being that there are only two selections on my dial, on or off. For like there is no try with Yoda. Do or do not. There is no try. There is no pacing oneself with me. And last weekend was an LNC meeting. And dear listeners, I am ahead with its chicken cut off in the weeks leading up to an LNC meeting. And for some reason, I thought it was just a fine and dandy idea to run for membership director of the Libertarian Party of Colorado offer to do the e-version of their newsletter, get the convention planning plopped in my lap since apparently do nothing was the game plan of the former planner, and be a general pain in the ass to my haters. Oh, all of this while having a pretty significant medical issue that I'm still dealing with. The too long do not read or do not listen, just another day in crazy town. So enough with that. You can help me be more regular. Well, hold on. What do your poops say about you? Now, I know this might seem like a joke, but you actually can learn a lot about your health from your daily dues. All right there. Settle down, Beavis. Uh, One way you can assist is by becoming a show patron through our Patreon account. Is that what it's called? Patreon link, which will be down in the show notes, like our newest supporter, Cole Euchre. Euchre. He seems to be missing a missing a, a, a consonant in there. Cole Euchre. Cole, let me know. <laughs> and how will that help? Well, my longish term goal is to concentrate more significantly on projects like this and my YouTube channel, Pink Flame of Liberty. Yes, that is a shameless plug that you should go check it out while still being able to earn a living. Life demands that above all my gainful employment comes first. And the first 25% of it is being stolen from our non-benevolent. So non-benevolent, I think, is just a long and pretentious way to say evil reptilian overlords so that I can shift from my normie work to do more liberty work. If there is more time, there will be more product. It's a simple economics and production problem. A five-ounce bird? Could not carry a one pound coconut. And you can also help by using my Amazon affiliate link in the show notes as your starting place for any Amazon search or purchase, as it will credit your purchase to my referral, even if you do not buy the gems that I highlight. But I suggest, I seriously urge you to take a look at my suggestion this time. It is a must 
have item and the reviews are priceless for instance and i will um i'll I'll, I'll take out some of the words to to leave a sense of uh, mystery but this product it is promised will imbue you with superhuman abilities such as the power to make everyone around you feel awkward and uncomfortable being first among them wait (laughs) Sounds a bit like libertarianism sometimes, doesn't it? All righty then. Please go and check it out. Do your purchases and it will help me. And as for our special product, yeah, I bought one. I need help. So without further ado, on to the show. I had let you know last episode that I would like to have some regular mini features to fulfill the goal of this show being not just another Liberty podcast, but one focused on the Libertarian Party specifically in some way, particularly the dirty birdie business of politics. So I said, self, what would be a good name for this segment? And As I'm fond of saying, being on the Libertarian National Committee has given me a proctologist look into how the sausage is indeed made. How about the sausage factory? And then I kind of went, that might be taken the wrong way and reinforced the idea that the Libertarian Party is made up of a bunch of socially awkward white guys who behave like sharks with chum in the water when someone of the female persuasion comes to a meeting. But then I said, chickadee, the tagline of this show already is where size does matter. So it's a bit too late to be squeamish about adolescent puns. And sometimes, well, the LP does deserve that thirsty reputation. And the many fierce Liberty women will soon disabuse any newcomer of the notion that this is a boys club. Nose girls allowed. So Whoop, here it is. And in this installment of The Sausage Factory. Dear Libertarian Party, if we could manage to not pinch out another weld loaf, that would be great. It feels like years since Governor Weld became the living porn hub spoof meme of cheating blonde screws the entire party by switching his party affiliation From Libertarian back to Republican, but it's only been a few months. Now, before I can adequately uh, vent my spleen and deal with my feelings and thoughts about that particular betrayal, we need to take a journey back to 2006, to the first time Weld bent the LP over a desk. This was in New York, and New York has a form of fusion tickets where candidates can be the nominees of more than one party. I'm not a fan of that, to put it lightly, but it is what it is. Governor Weld was seeking the Republican nomination for governor and felt that also having the Libertarian Party of New York's nomination would be an advantage to him. Likewise, this was seen also as a potential opportunity for the Libertarian Party of New York to obtain the 50,000 votes needed to secure ballot access for the next four years something which had never been done and, in fact, was only just accomplished in 2018 with the phenomenal efforts of Larry Sharp. So timing-wise, the time for the nomination of the LPNY candidate for governor would be prior to the selection of the Republican Party nominee through their primary system. And Prior to the New York LP convention, multiple chairs of local Republican parties wrote Governor Weld a very interesting letter that I will recount here. Dear Governor Weld, as county chairs of the New York State Republican Committee, feels gross just even reading that. We are very concerned about your willingness to solicit and accept the endorsement of the Libertarian Party 
for your campaign for governor. While you may receive some short-term benefit from obtaining a second line on November's general election ballot, you potentially could create serious political problems for each and every Republican candidate for years to come should the Libertarian Party reach 50,000 votes and qualify as a recognized party in New York. Another recognized party would force all Republicans to consider obtaining the party's endorsement at election time or leave it to their opponents. This could seriously change the political landscape Republicans face each year in a state where we are outnumbered by five to three. One look at the platform of the Libertarian Party demonstrates the controversy Republicans would face. Positions out of the political mainstream the Libertarian Party has taken include supporting an end to the American military as we know it today, supporting the legalization of unlawful drugs and prostitution, calling for an end to the legal drinking age, opposing general laws against pornography or obscenity, supporting full marriage rights to same-sex couples, calling for an end to all restrictions on immigration into the United States, and supporting full amnesty for all illegal immigrants already here. Their platform simply does not reflect Republican principles and values, forcing Republican candidates into facing additional opponents. Oh, no. God, sorry. Or not sorry. Sorry, not sorry. Or opponents with additional ballot strength each year. We can't have that, can we? As county chairs, we ask that you refrain from accepting their endorsement. By accepting the Libertarian endorsement, you could be subjecting the Republican Party to consequences that are unimaginable and long-lasting for the sake of political expediency. Very, very interesting points in that letter. But one point I wanted to highlight right here is is not just the ideological differences, which I'll get into in a bit, but the recognition that the Republicans simply do not want competition. They have kept libertarians off the ballot numerous times in numerous states. They are no friend of ours. While there might be certain candidates within the Republican Party that you may think reflect some of your values. The fact is support for the Republican Party is support for gross ballot censorship. But continuing on our major subject, at that time, since the Libertarian Party of New York would have had no recourse to secure or attempt to secure its needed ballot access if Governor Weld did in fact drop out of the LP nomination due to these dire prognostications, or if he simply failed to obtain the Republican nomination, he was asked bluntly by Sam Sloan. Question. I want to make sure that you are going to stick to this to the end, no matter what threats you get from the Republican Party. And by the way, will you run even if you don't get the Republican Party nomination? Answer, yes and yes. Don't trust me. Hear it straight from some orifice of the actual horse in question. It has happened in the past. That we have nominated a Republican a, a candidate for governor, and he has chickened out and withdrawn, especially Howard Stern. And I believe this happened two or three times where our candidate has withdrawn after being nominated. I want to make sure that you are going to stick through this to the end, no matter what threats you get from the Republican <coughs> Party. And by the way, will you run even if you don't get the Republican Party nomination? Yes, and yes. And uh, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure you could infer that those five small county chairmen are not supporting me for the Republican nomination. (laughs) So I think that was pretty clear. So what happened? Well, on or about June 1st, 2006, Governor Weld lost the formal endorsement of the Republican Party to John Faso. Now, he could still have 
contested this nomination by running in the in, in the Republican primary, but he declined to do so, um, allegedly because the the chairman of the Republican Party in New York called Governor Weld asking him to drop out of the race in the interest of party unity. Republican Party unity, that is. And lo and behold, the next day, Governor Weld announced that he would not continue to seek the Republican nomination. Now, this is something that the Libertarian Party of New York had been concerned about. Thus, Mr. Sloan's question. And boy, were they in for a surprise if they expected Governor Weld to keep his word since after that announcement, he also told the Libertarian Party of New York that he would not be accepting their nomination as well. Leaving them shit up the creek, basically, and in a very, very bad position. But not only that, completely betrayed because they had expected him to keep his word. And listening to the rest of his speech that I I took that clip from, and the link will be in the show notes, it's very interesting. Governor Weld is somewhat of an enigma. He actually came out and said taxation is theft. Wonderful. At first, you might be like, rah, rah, that that, that sounds like a, a hardcore libertarian there. But then he also said things like, this. Uh, there are, to be sure, under the Fifth Amendment, proper exercises of eminent domain. Uh, takings for public infrastructure, uh, is uh, that's a proper use. Uh, it's unfortunate, I think, that the Supreme Court Kelo decision seems to permit the government to use eminent domain solely to increase a government's tax base. And, and this, I believe, is fundamentally improper. The reason I highlight that particular quote is because eminent domain is not a negotiable item to the Libertarian Party. It is an item that is specifically condemned in the Statement of Principles. Some might say that Governor Weld was simply acknowledging the unfortunate reality of the fact that it is something that is enshrined in the Constitution. I would Remind everyone that so was slavery at one point and that he just simply was saying things as they are. But the fact is he went on to criticize rightly, not enough, the 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 keto decision where or is it kilo? I'm thinking of the diet, but the the little pink house one where the government expanded or interpreted its eminent domain powers more broadly than Governor Weld thought proper. And, of course, under the Constitution, that was a completely valid way to resolve this issue. It was the Supreme Court. You know, everything was done pursuant to procedure, yet he disagreed. So he had no problem disagreeing with how things are. And the only thing he would condemn was this larger scope of eminent domain, but not eminent domain itself. And that is highly problematic, where it would not only um, conflict with the explicit statement in the Statement of Principles against eminent domain, but also the broader principle of no one should be forced to sacrifice their lives or property for the benefit of of others. And that is a fundamental truth to which Governor Weld has many exceptions. I could play more clips from this, but you'll have the link. You can listen for yourself. He was asked outright if he would condemn the war on drugs. He would not. He got into technicalities as to whether or not people were in jail for small quantities or large quantities, but really didn't deal with whether they were violent offenses or nonviolent offenses. And in fact, went so far to say that he probably would not sign a medical marijuana bill that did not have all kinds of uh, FDA and regulatory restrictions on it, not just to make sure it was a safe product. He basically said he does not trust the patient to make decisions for themselves. He would not allow self-medication. 
that goes against the very essence of self-ownership. But then what do you do with statements like taxation is theft or items such as that, which people who defend him even to this day will go on to point out? And to answer that, I'm going to go back to that letter I read earlier in which it was stated, one would look at the platform of the Libertarian Party to demonstrate the controversy that Republicans would face. Positions out of the political mainstream the Libertarian Party has taken include supporting an end to the American military as we know it today, supporting the legalization of unlawful drugs and prostitution, calling for an end to the legal drinking age, opposing general laws against pornography or obscenity, supporting full marriage rights to same-sex couples, calling for an end to all restrictions on immigration into the United States, and supporting full amnesty for all illegal immigrants already here. With the conclusory statement, their platform simply does not reflect Republican principles and values. And that bingo is the money statement. Ultimately, Governor Weld's values are Republican. Well, considering his betrayal, I'm not even quite so sure it is fair to call him a Republican. He is a politician and he will be whatever is expedient at the time. Is that an Unfair characterization? I don't think so. For while touting lower taxes, smaller government, he went on to support Barack Obama in 2008. And even more infamously, at least the libertarians, to quote unquote vouch for Hillary Clinton during the 2016 election because it was more important to him to defeat Trump rather than show any kind of gratefulness, loyalty, integrity, in my opinion, to the party that gave him the honor of their nomination. And it is, in fact, an honor. We need to stop acting like we are the beggars. We have ballot access that is valuable. It is a deal that should involve good faith on both sides and turning around at the end and vouching for a a candidate that most libertarians not only consider just not libertarian, so we would have opposed her, but just absolutely um, morally despicable. And in some sense, I know Bill Weld disagrees a criminal, but certainly a criminal in violation of people's rights, even if not technically in violation of the law, though I am certainly not convinced of that, went on to use the platform we gave him to vouch for her. I am sorry. Not really. There is absolutely no excuse to this. And when persons, you know, we libertarians at the time bent over backwards to try to say it wasn't an endorsement because he didn't use the magical word endorsement. And I would say then that I certainly hope that everyone who did that were defenders of Bill Clinton when he said he did not have sexual relations with that woman. And it all depends upon what the word is, is we should not have to lawyer up people's words. That is not what the party of principle should be expecting from its candidates, and we should not be doing that. And then this brings me to the next episode. We're bringing it into the the, the current year um, where some additional lorrying up of words had been done. And of course, I could spend a good deal of time talking about his unlibertarian stances on gun rights and the flip and the flop and the flippity floppity flippity flop on that, you know, the, the, the support for, um, no fly lists. I mean, the list is long. The, um, the repudiation of uh, the, the repeal of the income tax where he said, well, we don't really need to go that far in that town hall with governor Johnson. But, These are things a lot of us are pretty familiar with, and my main purpose here isn't to talk about ideological differences. 
I do not demonize people simply because they disagree with me. I try to reason with them to agree with me. Where I am upset is at the lies and the betrayal and the using us. And I think that is perfectly legitimate. This is not some kind of purity hunt, though ultimately with Bill Weld, I have to come to the position that he quite simply is not a big L libertarian. I also do not think he is a small L libertarian, but what he is, is a liberal Republican, perhaps even a libertarian Republican, but that is not the same thing as a libertarian. It is also certainly not the same thing as a big L libertarian. And I do not like to classify people. I like to classify ideas. But when there is an overarching theme and loyalty, we get put into that position where the conclusion is patently obvious. And to say that a libertarian Republican is, you know, the same thing as a libertarian would be to say that vegan leather is, you know, basically the same thing as leather. And I'm not using that analogy in order to imply that one is fake and one is real. Both sides can be completely sincere in what they believe. We do not need to impute bad motives, ill character, or anything to their ideological beliefs. But what we do need to recognize is they come from fundamentally different places. Leather comes from a cow, and vegan leather comes from not cow. And that makes a difference, though superficially, in many ways, they may look similar, they may serve similar functions, they may even feel similar. They may satisfy in certain respects the same aesthetics, but they do not spring from the same source. And that is something very important to recognize. I do not fault Governor Weld for believing differently or from straying from purity or anything of the sort. I, my beef is one of integrity. And before Getting into the current betrayal, I'd like to add a few other personal pieces to the story. That episode with New York bothered me. It bothered me really badly in 2016. As I've said before, I did not vote as a delegate for Bill Weld. I would have voted for um, Noda first. I would have voted for Harambe first. And the New York incident was a big reason why course, there were others, including his very flippant statement at convention that, hey, you know, I read your guys' platform two weeks ago and I kind of like it. You're seeking the one of the highest nominations in the party and you read the platform two weeks ago and you kind of like it. And that was just supposed to be like an OK thing to say. It just there was not the mutual respect that I would expect. And I think we all know that Governor Weld received the nomination because Gary Johnson begged for him. And Gary Johnson has a lot of credit, a lot of political capital within the Libertarian Party. And he utilized it to get Bill Weld in the door. I do not know whether he regrets that at this point. I can only hope that he did. But It was a very, very tight race, and we almost had Larry Sharp. We could have had Larry. How different things may have been. But back on track to the the personal details I wanted to add. So that 2006 thing really, really bothered me. And then I saw that Governor Weld was pretty much at least it looked like at the time, positioning himself to be our 2020 nominee. I went through the wailing and gnashing of teeth and the angst and the Facebook fits and everything else that so many other people did go through. But ultimately, we are dealing with politics and political realities. And 
I determined that those sorts of things simply were not productive. If he were to be our nominee, I resolved that I would try to make him a better nominee, to try to assist rather than just being a heckler. So I set plans in place, put out feelers to let people know that I would like to have a chat with Governor with Governor Well to, to that end, to get to know him and to see what I could do to hear him out, to try, if I could, to be part of a movement to make him a better candidate rather than just yelling and screaming and whining and ranting. So I, the first opportunity for some personal engagement was at the 2018 um, Libertarian Party of Louisiana convention. And there was a question and answer period. And my question focused on the, the, the 2006 New York incident, but more specifically, what his explanation was for that when he was asked about it during his 2016 run for our nomination. I might be more forgiving than some. I basically realized, you know, sometimes people just screw up and do bad things. And the the measure of a man is how they react afterwards. If we're looking for the perfect man, we'll never Find them, but someone who is willing to own up and fully own and take responsibility for their mistakes to me is a person of integrity. And in 2016, the way Governor Weld had characterized what happened in 2006 is basically it was just an unfortunate situation that we hoped would work out and it just didn't work out. That is not what happened. He betrayed the New York party. It wasn't just an oopsie. Well, you know, we tried type thing. He backed out and he backed out for Republican interests and completely left them stranded. So, wasn't just what happened in 2006. It was the failure to take accountability for what happened in 2006. So at the 2018 Louisiana convention, I asked Governor Well to explain his response. And I had you know, reminded him of the New York thing, which, of course, he knew what I was speaking about. And I asked him then, I, I basically, I asked him, why did you say in 2016 that it was just something that didn't work out? You know, basically, why did you characterize it as such and such? And Governor Weld's answer to me was, I don't remember what I said in 2016. And I was gobsmacked. I should have brought the transcripts, right? I should have brought the receipts. But this was so well known that I did not expect him to say that. So, okay, my bad. I sat down and just said to self, self, next time I will will bring I'll bring the receipts. The person after me um, said to Governor Weld, Hey, um, it looks like you might be gearing up for a 2020 presidential run. Yet in 2016, you said that would be your last political campaign. And what was Governor Weld's answer to that gentleman? I don't remember what I said in 2016 or something to that effect. And I'm sitting there going, hmm, uh, seems to be some inconvenient statements that are just conveniently forgotten and that didn't sit well with me, but I wanted to speak with him personally. And I had the opportunity to do so at the Massachusetts convention where we sat at the same table and actually had a personal conversation. He gave me his phone number and his email address. And I have to tell you that contrary to other 
you know, maybe predispositions I had, I found him to be quite a delightful person. He was very warm and engaging. And the way he explained to me, he didn't really, and he didn't really admit that he lied in 2016 about what happened in 2006. And I, you know, I'm not looking for a pound of flesh, but what he said to me is it was a culture shock to him when he came to our convention and being taken from one pond to another so quickly that he was a bit dazed and intimidated. And, you know, sometimes when you're dazed and intimidated and in culture shock, you, 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 you say things defensively. And he now took full ownership for what he did in 2006. And he says that he apologized to the Libertarian Party of New York. And he assured me that since 2016, he says that he understands us, meaning the Libertarian Party, a lot better and that his understanding has expanded enormously. And I took him at his word and the, the, the speech he gave that day in the room that I was in seemed to indicate that. Or perhaps, as I now come to believe, it just seemed to, to indicate a, 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 an uncanny chameleon um, ability. So I left that conversation um, heartened and encouraged and excited. I also gave a talk at the Massachusetts convention and Governor Weld was in the audience. And my talk was pretty radical about the radical foundations of the party. You guys know my whole love affair with the statement of principles. And he was giving me thumbs up and, it, you know, it, everything was good. It was come by. Uh, I was ready, you know, to assist in the Weld America together, if that is what it was going to be. And he had told me ahead of time that he was going to have to leave at some point during my talk because he had a, you know, there was like two seminar tracks or, or, or something to that effect. I could be getting a little bit of my, my um, timing and um, sequence of events a bit discombobulated here, but the, the substance is essentially correct that he would not be able to stay there for the whole presentation. And when he, he, you know, he left very discreetly at some point, Later in my question and answers, I started getting some weird questions from people in the audience, such as, what would I think of a libertarian candidate that was advocating for free college? And it comes to turn out that immediately or close enough to immediately after giving me all these assurances and how he understands us and he he gave a great speech that libertarianism is not centrism. And, you know, I thought he was really getting it. Apparently, he went into another room and advocated for free college. And that right there, just it showed that he either did not really get us or did not care and that we were being used and judging by the 2006 incident, one thing seemed more likely than another. But I tend to be a very trusting person. And speaking with other people in Massachusetts, you know, we powwowed about how we could take his good impulse, his good impulse that people needed to be equipped for good jobs and to have good lives and to be able to provide for their families, that perhaps there was a libertarian way to accomplish this with maybe uh, companies or trades sponsoring certain education. So I left with that sort of a mindset. And then we fast forward to the beginning of 2019, where we learn that Governor Weld switched his party registration from Libertarian to Republican. And what really burned me up about that besides the fact that no matter how much spinning people are going to do of words of his that I will shortly play of his pledge to be a libertarian for life type thing. 
and I will I will deal with the uh, apologist for his defection. What really got my goat is something I do not know for a fact, but I do suspect highly. And that is that he did not even have the courtesy to give Chair Sarwark the heads up that he was going to do this. As chair of the party, Nick has a tough job. And he had a very tough job in 2016, perfuming the hog that was that campaign at times. But that was his job, and he did it. And he did it with many slings and arrows directed towards himself. And for me to believe that after that support, that he did not even give him the heads up that this was coming, that Nick had to learn it through Facebook the way the rest of us learned it, was unconscionable and completely disrespectful. Do I know for sure that Nick didn't have a heads up? No, but I'm as sure as I'd make a bet on it. I'm, I'm sure in my intuition, I cannot swear on my life, but pretty darn close. And that just burned me. No one was given notice to prepare. And It just went to show that it is all about expediency. The Libertarian Party and Libertarian principles are not and never were important to Governor Weld. Right now, what is important to Governor Weld is hurting Trump. Whether or not you agree with his position on Trump, the fact is he used us then. We dodged a bullet because he would have used us again in 2020. Can you imagine that if it looked like we were going to have success, where we would be the swing, the difference between Trump and it could be Hillary again, who knows, that he wouldn't have just thrown it. He would have. He would have done it in a heartbeat. And I think we all know that. So to the words now that I'm concentrating on is his promise to the delegates at the 2016 convention. Let's take a listen. Will you look me in the eye, will you look every libertarian in the eye here who has fought for this party for years and fought for our rights and tell us that you will not betray us. Alicia, thank you so much uh, for having me up here. As I think I indicated earlier in my remarks, uh, I'm a libertarian for life. I look forward to being, uh, having the opportunity, if nominated, to to work with Governor Johnson and you uh, over the next uh, five months uh, on on the business of... uh, getting us elected, not only in the White House, but down ticket, and then the business of governing as to which we will need a lot of help. Libertarian for life means not go back to any other party, just for the sake of clarity. Rejoining another party means a betrayal of the Libertarian Party. Yeah, no, I will not do that. And you want to know something? Something amazing just happened here. You want to know what amazing just happened here? I relied upon my memory. And my memory gave more benefit of the doubt to Governor Weld than he deserved. My memory, and apparently the memory of many of his defenders on Facebook, was that he simply promised to be libertarian for life. And my outrage has stemmed just from that. I forgot 
the clarifying statements that that meant he would never go back to another party. Because what a lot of his apologists have been saying is, well, you know, he is a life member of the Libertarian Party. So technically, he's a libertarian for life. Let's just say that is all he promised, though we just heard that's not. So now this is just sheerly an intellectual exercise. But let's just pretend that was all he said. Does anyone really think that delegates hearing that would take it to mean, I promise that I've paid you guys $1,500 and I'll just go and campaign and be a candidate for the Republicans. And that's what libertarian for life means. Come on. It's a load of horse shit. Makes me mad. It makes me mad, not just his betrayal, but that libertarians of all people defend it. That should not be. This is indeed the Big L podcast. And normally... The Big L stands for, you know, Big L Libertarian. But we've just found another reference point for the Big L because Bill Weld is a big liar. I will close with the uh, recording of a speech I gave on the main stage in 2016 opposing the nomination of Bill Weld and in support of Phil, uh, Will Coley. I said Phil Coley. That's weird. Who was uh, Daryl Perry's running mate. I had supported Daryl Perry for the top of the ticket and then his running mate, Will Coley. Will Coley dropped out during the rounds as happens. And then I threw my support without regret behind Larry Sharp. But my words turned out to be a bit prophetic. And I have to tell you, you know, people think, um, you know, this tough rod, and in some ways I am, but I felt bad. I like I, I hoped I didn't hurt Bill's feelings after that speech. Yeah, I feel like such a sucker. You know, I feel like such a sucker. All of us Are we ever going to learn our lesson? And hearing people talk, I don't think we are. And that's sad. And I will do what I can to try to not let that happen again. But my conscience is clear that I did not cast my delegate votes in that direction. There will be a bonus episode to this one, which... Big L patrons will get first. So please, please, please become a patron so you can get more content like this. And what the bonus episode will consist of is more details as to exactly, well, there might be two bonus episodes. Here's where my thoughts are going. First will be bonus details about exactly how squirrely Bill Weld's positions over the years have been and how the Libertarian Party itself had been one of his biggest critics. It isn't as if he flew under the radar. The other and this I might do as a main episode, the the digging up some of the history of the Libertarian Party's criticisms of Bill Weld, that will definitely be a bonus. But What may be a main one, I haven't decided, is to put some context and defense behind my idea that Republicans and Libertarians are not kissing cousins. They are not, you know, they're not of the same ilk. We have some overlapping positions, but there's this false perception that they are our natural allies. And on some things, perhaps, but like the vegan leather, they come from an entirely different place. And libertarianism is not 
conservatism by any stretch of the imagination and not even in the economic realm, just as libertarianism is not progressivism by any stretch of the imagination, even in the social values realm. With that, we'll close with my uh, my closing firecracker speech, and I thank you for your patience, and I beg you for your support. Until we talk again, you have an awesome day. Mi guapas de libertad. The last name to be placed in nomination for Vice Presidency of the United States of America, Mr. Will Coley. My name's Karen Ann Harlos. You all have heard from me before when I was endorsing Daryl Perry. And I was asked just a few moments ago, actually, if I'd be willing to speak for Will Coley. And I said, sure. So this is not going to be nearly as prepared as last time. And I'm certainly not as uh, professionally dressed as before. But I think that this really reflects on us as libertarians that we can do things on the spot and be both formal and informal. And I don't think our party is about respectability politics, so I do not mind that I'm up here in jeans and a t-shirt. Now, first thing I would like to say is even though I had endorsed somebody else, we all need to get behind Governor Johnson. He is our nominee and we need to move this party forward. And I would like to say something about Governor Johnson that I've respected extraordinarily much, is in his campaign he has conducted it with class. And that is something that I greatly respect. Now, Gary spoke before, and unfortunately I might have to say some things that are a little bit critical, not necessarily of Governor Johnson, but of things that are of great concern to me. Gary spoke about representing us all and asked for us to choose his particular vice presidential nominee. But as you know, as libertarians, we select these separately and we don't necessarily have to take his choice. And he said he wanted to represent us all but I respectfully say that his choice does not represent us all, and it is going to exclude some of us. And what I ask of all of you, and I would say the person that would accomplish this most is Will Coley, but I ask of all of you, do not split us. Do not split us the way Trump and Hillary have split their parties. Make sure that if you're going to, you know, select a vice presidential candidate, that that one per person will then represent the rest of us that maybe are not necessarily feeling represented. We do have a wide variety and diversity of views here. I make no bones about it that I come from the libertarian wing of the Libertarian Party, and I want to see us also represented here. And I think Governor Johnson will do some marvelous things for us, and he presents some more pragmatic side. But I ask that you balance out this ticket with someone that will represent the rest of us and not split the party activist base. Now, as far as some of my criticisms, and I do, I hope, mean this, not with incredible disrespect, but out of a love I have for this party. Um, Gary Johnson's nominee, or selected, what he would like to be our vice presidential nominee, just joined this party. And I haven't been with this party a great deal of time, but I can tell you when I first joined, I was asked to do things for the Libertarian Party of Colorado. And I declined. I said, I have not yet paid my dues. I do not yet know the culture of this party. And we're talking about someone who just read our platform. I had for myself a minimum of a year in this party of going out and doing outreach booths and volunteer efforts and put in my dues before I would ask for people to give me some kind of position. And I don't think we should be doing this for one of our highest office. And I hope I do. This is coming across with respect and just out of passion and love. Now, 
Uh, Gary also spoke about we're trusting him to get the message out, and we do need to trust him. But there will be two people to do this. So let's balance this out with someone who will know some of the other aspects of our message that we can really trust both of them. And Gary also spoke about who will get media attention, and unfortunately he spoke about the problems where Judge Gray that one time did not get the media attention. Well, I think Will Coley can do this. He represents an, under, an underrepresented segment of our population. He could reach the Muslim community that has felt disenfranchised by the two major parties, and I think that this would be phenomenal for our party. Ms. Uh, John McAfee spoke about there being a, a, a lack of women and minorities. Well, I believe that Will Coley can also reach some underrepresented areas. So I, I asked you yesterday for Daryl to stick close to principles, and I recited to you our party statement of principles, and I asked that you all bring that to mind, that you stick close to principles, and for, you know, to run with Governor Johnson, that you would pick somebody who really, really sticks close to principles and keep our party base, keep us from our, in, in our roots and where we know where, we're, where we came from. And I'm sorry this wasn't as polished as my other one, but I hope that I've spoke from my heart and that you will represent us all in your choices. We, we select our vice presidential nominee separately. I ask that you choose Will Coley or someone that has also dedicated the time to this party and didn't just read our platform two weeks ago. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Big L, where size does matter. Subscribe today and help support the show by going to BigLPodcast.com. This has been a Pax Libertas Productions podcast. I must take this time to disseminate the appropriate disclaimers and advisories. If it pleases the crown, while I am an officer of the National Libertarian Party and have in fact sold my soul to the blessed chicken on a stick... All opinions, perspectives, rants, jokes, and outbursts of any and all kinds are solely me speaking on my own behalf and not on behalf of the party. I am not the party spokesperson, just a fanatic who happens to hold a position. Before anything else, I am a liberty activist, just like you. And if you call me a politician, I die a little inside. Thank you.